Well, so far in this unit, we've covered how to get people to be in your study, how to design your study once you have those people. It's about time we talk about what do you even do with the results when you finish your study. So in this experiment, we're going to investigate the effects of caffeine on heart rates. So we have 10 student volunteers who are randomly assigned to drink pop with caffeine. I'm from Minnesota, so I'm going to call it pop. The remaining 10 students were assigned to drink caffeine-free pop. Um, were their findings statistically significant? So we're going to talk about what that means um, a little later in the video. So here's the data from this very small scale experiment. Here are the 10 students who had caffeine. Uh, this is their final pulse rate minus the initial pulse rate. So sometimes I just make a little note to myself, since it's final minus initial, a positive number here is going to mean that the heart rate increased, right? Like maybe 10 minus 8. Final was 10, initial was 8, it increased. You can see at the end the mean change for our caffeine group and the mean change for our non-caffeine group. So the caffeine group, their heart rates increased more than the non-caffeine group. So in number one, just find the difference in the mean pulse rates. So you're just going to take caffeine minus no caffeine. Does your initial reaction lead you to believe that uh, they found evidence that caffeine does or does not increase the heart rate? So the calculation isn't hard, but then the second part of the question is, does this convince you that caffeine increases heart rate? Pause the video and jot down your thoughts now. So the difference here is 1.2. That's possible evidence that caffeine does increase heart rate. Um, the question is, is it enough evidence to convince you? So if your answer was yes, that's totally fine. Maybe this is enough evidence for you to say, yeah, definitely, caffeine increases heart rate. If the answer was no, the question then is, what difference would it take to convince you that caffeine increases heart rate? Would it have to be at 2 or 3, or would you have to see something even more extreme? This is kind of the basis of all inference that we do. Were our results convincing enough um, to prove that some phenomenon happened? There's two possible explanations for this difference in the mean pulse rates. One, either caffeine increased heart rate, or two, it was a coincidence. So based on your answer to number one, some of you think that option one is true. Caffeine did increase heart rate. And some of you might be skeptical and think, well, 1.2 isn't that big of a difference. This was just a coincidence. So here's what we're going to do. To decide if this difference is big enough to be convincing, we're going to do a simulation, which is basically where we run the experiment many, many times without actually doing the experiment. Here's the assumption we're starting with. Caffeine does not increase the heart rate. So we're basically starting with this second option. We're going to assume that it's just a coincidence that we saw this difference in the study and that caffeine doesn't actually do anything to your heart rate. This is going to lead to our second assumption. If it's true that caffeine does not increase heart rate, then this would also be true. The heart rates of each participant would be the same no matter which group they ended up in. For example, this person here whose difference in heart rate was 6 would have had 6 as a difference no matter which group they ended up in. This person who had negative 1 would have had a negative 1 no matter which group they ended up in. This 5 would have been the same no matter which group. That's the idea. Normally I would do this simulation on paper, and I would have everyone do the simulation like 10 times, and then we'd put all our data together on the whiteboard. Obviously that's not really happening right now, so I'm going to show you how to do this electronically. You're going to need the spreadsheet, and you're going to need Staplet. The spreadsheet looks like this. I have the caffeine group in red. These are the same numbers you'll see on your guided notes, and I have the non-caffeine group in blue. Here this is automatically calculating the average of these 10 numbers and this is automatically calculating the average of these 10 numbers. This number here is automatically calculating the difference between caffeine and no caffeine. So you're going to need to make your own copy of this. You're going to click File, Make a Copy, and then here's what we're going to do. You're going to right click on column A, and one of the options is Randomize Range. What that's going to do is shuffle around all the people in the study. Now remember, we're working on this assumption that these heart rates would have been the same whether they had had caffeine or not. So when we shuffle it around, we're basically saying, okay, well, these 10 people maybe end up in the caffeine group and these 10 people end up in the non-caffeine group. But it doesn't matter because caffeine doesn't affect their heart rate. Remember, that's our assumption. So this person was going to have a difference of 5 no matter where he or she ended up. This person was going to have a difference of negative 1, no matter where he or she ended up. 
Now I did color code these so you can see where they originally were. So now that I've mixed them up, this recalculates the new mean for the caffeine group and the new mean for the no caffeine group, recalculates the difference. What I want you to do is just jot down the difference here and then do this again. So right click column A, randomize, difference of zero. Oh, that time it was exactly the same. I want you to do that at least 10 times. The more you can do it, the better. If you're doing this for class, maybe your teacher is going to have you submit your data in a Google form and put the whole class's data together. But if you're doing this on your own, at least 10 times. And once you have all 10 data points, you're going to go to Staplet, do one quantitative variable, and just paste your data here so that you can get a dot plot. You're just going to do a sketch of your dot plot in your notes. Pause the video and do that now. Okay, so I was able to do that 18 times pretty quickly and then copy pasted it into Staplet. And this is what my distribution looked like. Yours likely looks different and that's totally fine. Our answers are going to vary a little bit, but that's okay. Some of these questions are opinion based anyway, so our answers were always going to be different. Next, pause the video and answer questions three and four on your own and then hit play and we'll go over them together. So for number three, each dot on this dot plot is representing a difference in means from one trial if caffeine really had no effect on heart rate. So each dot is the difference in the means in a single trial. It's basically like we just ran the experiment, for me, 18 times. And each time we ran the experiment, we were under the assumption that caffeine really didn't affect heart rate. Okay, so for me, um, there were only two dots that had a mean of 1.2 or greater. So this one was 1.2, this one was 1.4. Obviously yours is gonna be different than mine and that's okay. So for me, only 11% of the trials had a difference of 1.2 or greater. So when I'm interpreting, if caffeine really has no effect on heart rate, the probability of getting a difference in means of 1.2 or larger, like in this study, is 11%. Said a different way, there's an 11% chance of getting a difference of 1.2 or larger if caffeine really doesn't affect heart rate. Now number five, we're probably gonna have different answers because some of this is like your opinion, like did it convince you or not? So do you think the difference in means we found in this experiment is due to the caffeine or did it occur purely by chance? I have two different correct answers here. So for me, it was 11%. My personal answer um, would be 11% is small, but it's not that small. So I think the difference occurred by chance. In other words, caffeine does not increase heart rate. So there's no um, effect there. Now other people might say, well, 11% is a really small percent. So it's unlikely that this difference occurred by chance. So I think caffeine does increase heart rate. At this point in the course, I'm just asking, what do you think? Later in the course, we will learn like how to figure out where a cutoff is to basically say, okay, if I get a probability smaller than this, I will consider that good evidence. And I'll say it's unlikely that this happened by chance. For right now, it's sort of like, what would it take to convince you? Personally, 11% for me is small, but it's not that small. So I think this could have just been a coincidence. Now, if you were in the camp that said this percent is small, but it's not that small, I think this difference occurred by chance, you're saying that the results are not statistically significant. If you're in the camp that says, no, 11% is small, it is unlikely that this difference would have occurred by chance, you are in the camp that's saying this result is statistically significant. Now, we use the word significant in everyday life to mean like important. Like the day you get your driver's license is a significant day in your life. That's not really how we use it in statistics. In statistics, something that is statistically significant means you have results from a study that are unlikely to happen by chance. So it doesn't just mean important, it means unlikely to happen by chance. Now your numbers are probably different than mine. If you have a 20% here instead of 11%, then you're probably in the not significant group. 20% isn't that small. If you have a single digit number, like eight, seven, six, even five or smaller percent, you're probably in the significant group. I sort of wish that my 11% was bigger or smaller because it's a little wishy-washy where it is right now. I feel like you could say 11% is small or you could say it's big. But once again, 
the point right now is not to figure out like at what cutoff do we decide that something's significant. We will get to that. For now, it's just to understand what is the definition of significant. Okay, so at the end of a study, we do have to know um, who can we generalize to? Like, who are these results actually useful for? So there's two questions you can ask yourself. The first is, were the individuals randomly selected to be in this study? And if the answer is yes, you can do inference about a population. So inference is what we were just doing. It's where you take the results and you try to decide if something is likely or unlikely to happen by chance. Um, basically make conclusions. So if you randomly select the people to be in your study, then awesome, you can um, generalize your conclusions to the population that you selected from. If you didn't randomly select people, unfortunately you won't be able to do inference about the entire population. So the caffeine example, I think it said student volunteers, which means we can't generalize any of our conclusions to the population of all students, unfortunately. The second question you want to ask yourself is, are the individuals randomly assigned to the groups? So once we have them, are we randomly assigning them to groups? If the answer is yes, you can conclude that there is a cause and effect relationship. I think in the caffeine example, it did say people were randomly assigned. So we can conclude there's a cause and effect relationship, but we can't generalize our results to the entire population. Now it is possible to have both of these or neither of these or just one or the other. So here's kind of a summary. Were the individuals randomly selected? If yes, uh, then you can do inference about the population and then you can also have yes or no for the randomly assigned questions. So there's a bunch of different combinations here. Obviously you wanna be here. You wanna be able to conclude that there's a cause and effect relationship about your entire population. The least ideal place would be here because that would make you unable to conclude cause and effect and unable to generalize about the population. It's just not the best. Okay, so we have an example. Um, I'm not gonna read this out loud to you. Why don't you read it to yourself? And then there's two setups. So this is like what we want to investigate and then one and two are two different designs for doing an experiment. For each one, just decide if you can generalize to the population and decide if you can conclude that there is cause and effect. Pause the video and try answering these on your own. Okay, so in number one, we're getting everybody in our class to participate, which is not a random sample. That's a convenience sample. Um, so we can't conclude anything about the population of all students. And then we're asking them whether or not they already study with music and dividing them based on that question. So we're not randomly assigning them to a music group and a not music group. So we can't conclude that there's a cause and effect relationship. In number two, once again, no cause and effect relationship because we're splitting them up the same way, but this time it was a random sample of students and so we can make conclusions about the population of all students. A lot of this unit is vocab that you'll be able to review whenever you need and honestly you will remember very quickly. I think the trickiest part is figuring out this statistically significant stuff. The second half of AP Statistics is pretty much exclusively dealing with significant versus not significant. So if that idea can make sense to you now, you'll be in much better shape later. We will be hitting on it quite a bit. Like I, I try to work it in so much that when we really actually get to it, you're like, I feel like I've done this before. But no worries if it's confusing, we're gonna come back to it a lot in this course. And at some point during the year, I promise we'll turn on that light bulb.